another episode of Cosplay Interview. I'm here with Torque Jero, a cosplayer, uh, and he's cosplaying as today. Torque Jero. Torque That's my character's name. Yep. Yep. So, uh, for those who don't know, Torque Jero is a Star Wars character from the Star Wars universe, and yeah. So, how did you get started into cosplay? Uh, well, so we got to go back a little bit. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in a very strict evangelical household. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as a result, I never did Halloween. We weren't allowed to dress up, none of that stuff. Uh, but one thing I was allowed oddly enough was, uh, Star Wars. So I was a huge Star Wars fan as a kid. Loved it. Loved the whole concept, the universe and, and all nice. of that. Um, got as many toys as I could get my hands on. And so Star Wars is always a big thing to me. And as I got older and um, I started to see like the convention thing start to get bigger and, and saw people actually cosplaying, I really, really wanted to do that. But part of the problem was that I was really overweight. I was extremely overweight. Mm -hmm. And so uh, finding and affording or crafting your own materials when you're a size that's bigger than other people is incredibly expensive and very difficult and oftentimes does not feel very rewarding because yeah. no matter how hard you work, you're not going to get like a lot of recognition or especially early on, you know, it wasn't as socially accepted. You're not going to have a lot of support or people behind you. So um, I was just into making prop type things. I liked making, uh, blasters, uh, lightsabers and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2018, um, my weight got so bad that I nearly died. Wow. And, um, had a very eye-opening uh, moment personally with my my doctor and my wife, and you know we had a conversation. And if I can get this under control, um, you know I I need to have things to look forward to. I need to have a goal. Yeah. So one of the things I said to my wife was at that point they had announced they were building uh, Galaxy's Edge, mm -hmm. and I said if I lose 150 pounds. I am going to dress up in costume. I'm going to make a character, an original character. I'm going to dress up in costume. And we're going to go to Galaxy's Edge. And, you know, I'm going to be in Star Wars. I'm not just going to nice. visit, you know, but I'm going to actually immerse and be in character. And she was like, I'm down. You know, let's make me a costume, too. We'll go the whole way. And nice. that was like the entire time I started losing weight. That was my, my goal thing that I fixed on. I'm going to do this to get to this um yeah. so i ended up losing over 200 pounds um wow so I went congrats from, yeah 430 pounds to uh just under 230 now and um started building stuff and making stuff and then uh this summer was supposed to be the time that we were going to go to galaxy's edge to celebrate mm -hmm. and uh as everybody knows that was not possible for most of the summer yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm still just crafting and building stuff at home, hoping to eventually get to go there. Yeah, and that that's the biggest thing with uh, cosplayers now during the pandemic is uh, there's no conventions, there's nowhere to go to like show off your cosplays. You know, you can't even go to a friendly photo shoot with a bunch of Star Wars friends because COVID. Yeah. You know, it's it's like. And of course, you know, anybody over 200 pounds is, is like, you're like, I'm going to not go ahead and do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, because yeah, carrying around, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm like two, two twenty, two thirty pounds, you know, but like mostly I carry it right here in the, the front. And my wife keeps saying, that's a heart attack waiting to happen. That's a heart attack waiting to happen. <laughs> Well, that that's good yeah, that you you wait lost all that weight and now you're healthier and you you have a newfound uh, joy for cosplay. It gives you a good excuse to be active too. It gives you things to do. Like um, I tried really hard to find a local lightsaber group, and again, that's all dissolved now. But you know, that's basically a bunch of people waving sticks around um, and and moving around and being active. So there's yeah, there's stuff to do that keeps you you know not just sitting and since i i don't know what your day-to-day -day job is i'm a programmer so i yeah. sit uh, for eight hours a day so anything that gives you an excuse to get up and move around and do something and yeah. i think we've gotten to this point at least for me personally where there's no such thing as looking silly 
or yeah. feeling silly. You know, yeah. what I mean? it's like, if I'm moving, I'm I'm so happy. I don't care what anybody thinks. Yeah, I mean, you know? we don't we don't care. <laughs> you know exactly. So, what was your first official cosplay then? Um, man, if you want to go way back, uh, when I was a kid, like before cosplay was a thing, I built an entire homemade predator costume. When wow. I was a kid. So That's we awesome. went through this phase. Yeah. And imagine I was allowed to watch predator, but I wasn't allowed to do, uh, do Halloween, but, um, we went through this phase <laughs> when I was like 16 or so where every summer, everybody would be running around in the woods with super soakers because nobody could afford paintball. Yeah. And um, I had this idea, this picture in my mind that I was going to emerge from the woods in full predator regalia and just scare the ever loving crud out of everyone I knew. Nice. So I spent months living in the basement of my house, wiring LEDs and making wow. a helmet, and, like, breeding my own little dreads for the back of the helmet. Um, in retrospect, when I look at it, it was awful. It was god awful. But in the dark, it still was panic inducing. Yeah, of course. Um, so it didn't have the intended effect. Yeah. I had even wired, um, I cannibalized one of those uh, electronic squirt guns and wired it as a shoulder cannon. So I had a button on a glove and, a, and I pressed that, the shoulder cannon would fire. Nice. So I had gone, I think that technically qualifies as a cosplay. Yeah, uh, it technically like, does. When, you know, the materials a 16 year old kid with no money really has on hand uh, were, were severely limited. So, yeah, of course. So are you working on some more cosplays since the pandemic? Yeah, so I've, I've got to, I'm, uh, as far as Star Wars goes, I, I tend to lean towards OCs or original characters. Mm -hmm. um, I love, there's so many characters I love and I respect the hell out of people who can uh, make a cosplay and look just like, mm -hmm. you know, Mark Hamill or Harrison Ford or something. Uh, but for me, that's not it. I don't want to be another character. I want to be me, but in that universe. So okay, all my stuff smart. is OC. Yeah, all my stuff is OCs. So I've got some stuff here. Let's see what we can what we can get on camera. So I have yeah. uh, some armor I'm building for a Sith character. Wow. So you probably would see them in the um, in the image that I, I posted in my uh, my bio. Uh, got some more. Obviously, you saw the my DL44 blaster that I was building. Um, I've got some other um, blasters that I've been working on. And for me, what it is is you do some research and you find out how they made the original props for Star Wars. Like they took a World War II gun and they strapped a bunch of stuff to it and glued things on and, mm -hmm. you know, basically turned it into something that looks space. So my idea for original character is to go along those same lines. So start with a base, like an airsoft gun that's a replica of a World War II or a vintage gun and then mm -hmm. start to bolt things on, scopes. And this guy has a little stock on the back. It's a paintball stock. Um, it's got... Uh, rings for a, a shoulder sling and wow. um, figuring out how to do all that stuff and make it look like it belongs, even though it doesn't belong to a character. And there's stuff like this guy. So yeah. this is a 3D printed shell. And on the inside of it, what we have is a um, MP3 player that you can get for about 10 bucks on Amazon uh, for a greeting card. So okay. it's one of those MP3 players yep. that plays when you open the card. Yeah. So that's in nice. here and um we have some some sound effects and lights wow that is so cool so it looks so like thermal. like an actual thermal detonator <laughs> yep yeah yeah nice just other stuff i'll always be working on so this is my my current lightsaber that i'm working on so mm -hmm. uh there's a couple different ways you can approach building a lightsaber but this is a system they call asp which is uh, saber parts system from a company called saber forge yeah uh so i have a series of parts here all put together and then inside uh you can see the power supply right now yeah but there's a board that i've soldered and some lights and things so oh you even make some sounds what that's so cool so it's it's just building all that kind of stuff and soldering and wiring all that fun stuff yeah exactly. which i think for me is as much fun as some of the folks you interview have with like sewing and, and putting mm -hmm. things together. I can't sew to save my life, but I love, you know, wiring things up and figuring out how to make them make sound and interactive. Well, yeah. And what are you making the armor out of? Uh, so this armor is made out of Sintra, which is uh, sheets of ABS plastic. 
Mm -hmm. Generally, what they do is um, you, you create a vacuum table, which is a heated table attached to a shop vac, and okay. you make a mold and you lay the flat sheets over the mold, and then you heat it up and, and create the vacuum, and it sucks the plastic sheet down onto the mold. Oh, that's so and cool. And it creates, like, molded plastic armor. So that's the, the way they're made. And there are a bunch of guys that sell these in Facebook groups, and then there are a bunch of guys with tutorials on how to make the molds and the vacuum mm -hmm. table and all that. Other stuff. Yeah. But that's what they're plastic. It's very thin. I can't remember. It's three millimeter uh, Sintra uh, yeah. plastic that's just been heated and molded around some, some forms. But the good thing is it's lightweight and it's not going to be like a pain in the neck to carry around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So my whole thing, because I'm, I'm, you know, this is a, a Sith character, so he's going to mm -hmm. move around and stuff is it has to be mobile. I have to be able to wear it and, mm -hmm. and actually move like I would with uh, the lightsaber. Otherwise, what's the point? If yeah, I, if I'm exactly. Of moving, you know, yeah. I, and I, I respect the hell out of the guys who do the, the stormtrooper stuff, but they can't even sit down. Yeah, they can't sit down. They, they have to, you know, like, what's, you know, it's, there's, there's one thing about cosplay and there's another thing about, like, building a cosplay that you can't see or move out of, you know? It's just like, What's the point? You gotta have fun walking around, you know? Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. this one is like the simplest one I've made. It's literally just, you know, kind of deconstructing some of the Han Solo stuff. So you've mm -hmm. got like, you know, little bits of greeblies and patches and a vest and, you know, uh, I've got a gun belt and stuff. So those, those I think are so, I mean, that's why they put actors in them is because you can move around and it, you don't even really notice you have it on after a yeah, exactly. Whereas, you know, uh, people who build Iron Man suits and they can barely even move. You know, it's just like... I'm happy I'm with that. Though. Some of the stuff they do with Arduino and, and Pi uh, technology where those things, you know, open and close and spit out smoke and make all kinds of noise, that's mm -hmm. amazing. But I couldn't imagine being in one for six hours. That would yeah, be like torture. That, that would be torture. So... yeah. Have you ever been in a cosplay contest? I tr so uh, I live in Texas. I'm just north of Austin, Texas, and um, my wife talked me into trying to enter a cosplay contest at a library. Mm -hmm. And um, I was I was down to do it. I was excited. You know, it was just after I had first built this one, and then everyone else in the contest was under the age of thirteen. Oh, and so you're like, like no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I, I don't feel right about this for some reason either i'm gonna lose to them and i'll feel really bad or i'm gonna win and it's only because i'm older and i know how to you know wire things and i have more yeah. money because i have it so either way it didn't feel quite um plus they gave me some weird looks when i tried to sign up for the costume so i was like you know let's uh let's try this <laughs> in another venue at another, another time. venue another time yeah no it's it's true because you're you're just getting into cosplay and so you, you're you're learning all the the convention perks of being in cosplay and stuff. So yeah, you know maybe you'll go to a, a convention next year and we'll be able to get back to normal. But that's the hardest thing is during this pandemic, no one knows when it's gonna go back to normal. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I would imagine everybody's doing like I'm doing, which is you're gonna end up with this huge. Uh, sort of backlog of stuff that you've been making and just waiting for the opportunity. I joke with my wife that as soon as the restrictions are lifted and we can go out in the world, it's like everybody's going to come out in costume because you've done nothing but work on your your stuff. Yeah, you know, six eight months. And what what else is there to do? So, but then you know, people who wear costumes with masks and stuff should feel a little, um, uh, you know, justified in having spent all that time on on those types of costumes. Yeah now yeah make fun of you yeah exactly because uh you know it's part of your character now instead of just like oh uh yeah i have to slap this on over my cosplay no you know it's imagine if you had a full face full of makeup you know and you have to put on a mask and it's like uh-uh not good i think one of the fascinating things so i'm i'm 42 Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit older than a lot of folks I see doing cosplay. I'm old enough to remember when just having passing knowledge, like knowing who the bounty hunters were in Star Wars, was enough to get you branded as a social pariah and get the, the crap beat out of you, you know? 
Yeah. And I've watched the culture change from that to where being a geek is cool. And now we're in this world where um, it's almost a, an advantage to be asocial. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like if you weren't yeah. super social, you're probably doing okay right now. And so it's yeah. fascinating to me to watch the culture change, you yeah. know, from, from when I was a kid. And, you know, if you were talking to a kid like you're into football, you were just talking about that. But I, I was never into you know, Yeah, I, I couldn't you know, get into that. And other kids would be looking at me. I, I remember having kids tell me that I was, you're not a boy, you're not into sports. And I was like, I like things that blow up, you know? I like, I like you know, good guys who beat the crap out of people. So I don't know, yeah. that's pretty typically masculine. That's um, masculine, yeah. Oh. No, when I, was, when I was a kid, I was into theater, drama, and dance. And so, you know, that's what I was all, that was my whole entire high school, my junior high school. And uh, the only thing about football is my brother uh, loves the Cardinals. He's like a fanatic of the Arizona Cardinals. And uh, so when I was younger, he's like, you have to like a football team. I was like, I do. I'm like, okay, what's the rival team of the Cardinals? And he's like, and at that time it was the Cowboys. So I'm like, fine, I'm a Cowboys fan. And then he got on me for not knowing the lineup and everything like that. So I was like, well, forget it. I'm going to learn the lineup. And so then I was like, oh, okay, well, this sport's not that bad That bad now. Would I play it? No. I'm out, way out of shape for that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that. But, you know, the thing is uh, with – with cosplaying, you get to you get to have so much fun with uh, exploring different avenues, and the more you know about cosplay, like or anime or Star Wars or gaming or whatever, the more characters you can create. So, yeah. for you, it's more uh, armor making, right, rather than sewing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and prop building. That's cool. Yeah. So has this been something you want to learn is the sewing part? Or do you think you're like, you know what? I'll leave that to the experts. <laughs> there have been a few instances would it, where it would have been really useful to know. Like I, I can definitely see, and my wife even recently bought a sewing machine because we were talking about some other uh, projects. And I was like, you know, it would probably be really helpful and useful to know. It's just one of those things yeah. where concept of having a pattern and then how do I, like, I don't, I grew up cooking because my family's Italian, but I don't mm. cook from a recipe. Yeah. So the idea of building something from a pattern or making something from a pattern almost seems daunting. Um, and that's how you have to do it, right? You have to do know all the measurements and have the pattern laid out. and all that. So it's definitely way out there. But I can imagine, yeah. you know, worst case scenario, if they're, if they're talking about some of us being cooped up for so long, you know, well in the next year, right. it's only an eventuality, right? To, I would have to. Yeah, know, I'm, I, yeah. There's no way this thing is going to end in January. We're going to be going into next year. Unfortunately, that's the crappy thing is, and people are starting to lose their minds a little bit over us. But um, with you cosplaying original characters, what made you go to original characters versus like the well-known Star Wars characters? You know, I I feel like nobody is ever going to, and again, this is no hate on, on people. It's the same thing with lightsabers. Like, there's an entire world of people that want the exact lightsaber from the movie. Like, mm-hmm. they want to reproduce that, you know? And I, I don't think I'm ever going to be a better Luke Skywalker or Han Solo or whatever than Mark Hamill and um, Harrison Ford and, and all of that. Yeah. Like those, those guys just, they they nailed it, they did it, and, and it belongs to them. And for me, especially because I started this as, as such a big person, I wasn't yeah. even going to try to pretend to look like someone else. Yeah. So my idea was, you know, if I existed in that universe and, and for my character, my wife, who's a writer, was even like, make a backstory for him. Like, nice. Create a little biography of your guy and, and you know, have that, that feeling about it so that um, I, I belong in the universe, even if I'm not the guy that, you know, I'd be walking through the background for two seconds in a movie. That's so yeah. my character would be. But, yeah. you know, when you watch those movies, it's fa- I have, like, you know, the, the encyclopedias and the reference books and stuff, and you yeah. see all of these characters that people spent weeks and weeks designing and creating the props and all that stuff for that literally get, like, a split second of screen time just walking yeah, just walking. It's like, wait, what's that character in the back? You know, it, it's like that guy in Star Wars where he's like, "I don't like you. 
My friend doesn't like mm -hmm. you, or my friend doesn't like you. I don't like you either. Where's his backstory? I want to know it, about it, him. People get people get into it, and they write whole books about these background. Like he's got several stories written about. Him. Yeah, uh, Doctor Avizian, I think his name is, and um, like everybody in the background, all the bounty hunters, a lot of the characters that, like I said, just walk through a frame. Uh, if you mm. know who Dengar is, no. and that's where I started, but. I wanted to make a Dengar cartoon or costume because I was like, well, there's a big guy who's in Star Wars. He's a, he's yeah. relatively big compared to other people. Uh, but Dengar shows up in Rise of Skywalker as mm. this dude who's like like 90% machine. His face yeah. is all torn up and he's got all kinds of cyborg implants and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, they've written these long stories and somebody's going to write how Dengar got from dude wrapped in bandages to like Robocop you know, yeah. between Empire Strikes Back and Rise of Skywalker, someone will write that story. Yeah, of course. That people are so as as fascinating as those weird background stories are, I was like, I'd like to be a background story. I think that's what makes yeah. Star Wars interesting. That's cool. Very nice. Yeah, because um you you never know what the backstories are until somebody writes them and it, it's really cool. It's funny also when you say you grew up in an evangelical household because our the last cosplayer I interviewed yesterday also came from an evangelical household where Halloween was frowned upon. You know, it's it's yeah. really interesting how like a lot of people and with you being the same age as I am more or less I'm 39 basically in October. Um we grew up when cosplay was like frowned upon when we were kids right. it's like you were the nerd if you dressed up and now you're the outsider if you don't dress up and yeah. you'll see more and more people who are older going and cosplaying and they make it as authentic as possible because when we were younger the only cosplayers that were hireable were for movie premieres and they had to look like the character and it was like not until 20 2010 i think um co conventions started coming around more and people started yeah. embracing them and everything like that so when you do your photo shoot oh yeah go ahead i was gonna say i remember going to the premiere of phantom menace and there was one guy in the town where i was one guy who showed up in stormtrooper army and everybody just applauded that yeah because i was like that was the vacation he stood in line and then sat in the theater through that whole movie in full armor and I was like, man, this dude is, you know, 1999, that was huge. Yeah. I don't even know where he got the materials or anything that it, where there weren't cosplay groups and there wasn't as much stuff about how to do this vacuum forming. And so yeah. that man, like wherever he is today, I hope he's proud of himself. Cause that was, <laughs> right. he was a great one. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, do you do any photo shoots for your cosplays? Have you, have you done any photo shoots? So because I'm so new, um, I've only done a little bit, um, a couple weeks ago and, um, I posted it in the, the Star Wars cosplay group that you're in. My wife mm -hmm. and I, when I, when I first started doing this armor, I was like, I got to see if it moves. And so we did a, a video set to music of me doing, uh, lightsaber stuff. So I, I also have a, a martial arts background. Nice. Those. And, uh, so we did a, a short video. It's also on my Instagram as well. And it was just like, um, you know, I, I want to see what it looks like in motion. I want to make sure yeah. that I can move and, and all of that stuff. Exactly. So that's as close as I've gotten. But in terms of like having, you know, like actual photography with lighting and backgrounds and stuff, I haven't gotten. Oh, nice. So is there um, a cosplayer that you follow that is one of your favorites? Uh, so I follow a bunch. There's, there's a bunch of people in the armors thing. So there's a guy online in uh, Facebook, uh, his, all I know is his first name just goes by Walt and his group is called Walt's Trooper Factory. And around him in that community are about five or six people that build armor and, uh, build guns and, nice. and build a lot. Of Those guys I follow a lot because that's a whole community of people giving each other pointers on how to you know, uh, do lights and how to power, you know, your props and how to solder things without burning out the boards. So that, those cool. people are the majority of what I follow. And then there's a few folks randomly on Instagram. Mostly I follow hashtags. So I follow some cosplay hashtags, nice. and some Star Wars based hashtags. 
and when they come across, you know, I always like their stuff or I'll, I'll start following them, you know, to name uh, somebody specific, I probably couldn't do it. Just Yeah, it's true. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, cosplayers in, in, uh, you know, the community, there's a cosplayer that's actually in your area, um, called, um, oh, now I'm drawing a blank. Well, I'll get back to it. Um, but yeah, uh, she, she also cosplays and, you know, and she's from Texas as well. And, you know, it's, it's fun. It's the more and more cosplay gets more recognition and, and, and the spotlight, the more people are drawn to it. So do you have a cosplay horror story? Um, not well, as close as I got is before I lost weight and when I first started the armor thing. So before I got to Sintra, which is this, you know, light material, I was trying Mm -hmm. some armor that was made out of fiber, which is three or four times as as heavy and incredibly itchy. If you've ever sat on like fiberglass bleachers, you know, that's that's the, uh, the itchiness of it. So at that time, yeah, at, at that time, my wife and I lived in Miami. So right now we live... Uh, pretty close to Austin, Texas. And Austin is a very geeky city. It's a very open-minded city. There's a lot of tech people here. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, things in Austin are different than they were are in a lot of places in the country. So we had I had moved to Miami for work coming from Austin. And, uh, you know, we were talking about going out for Halloween. And I was like, I'm at, I'll just go out in the armor with a lightsaber and look like a, you know, a Jedi general. Yeah. Some armor and a robe and all. And people kept... People who knew what I was just kept going, hey, it's it's Star Wars. You know, that was like all they could say. They didn't understand what a Jedi was. They didn't know what the armor was. They would just point yeah. at me and say, hey, it's Star Wars. And then you would have a lot of drunk guys who would just point and laugh and be like, you know, nerd, like yeah, this is 1983. Right. Yeah. And uh, that was, a, obviously, I haven't bled for cosplay like some people were, but that was super awkward. And I was like, what's wrong with you? Like, unfortunately, we're at the point where we are in a society where i could really say it was that not me no. um but it it does show you the difference like if you're in a different city if you're in a place that's very closed-minded in in miami you know going out in costume is just about how slutty you look really and that's not to slut shame anybody but it's people who don't get to show a lot of skin 364 days a year getting to do it on halloween of course um so going out in a costume where you put that kind of effort into it and there's, you know, lights and there's a character and all that other stuff just doesn't fit in that environment at all. No. You are a woman does place. Yeah. No, it, it's true. Like, uh, unfortunately, the cosplay world is a very female-dominated industry. Um, the more assets you have, you know, th- that you want to show off, the more attention you're going to draw. Um, that cosplayer that I was speaking of earlier is called Blue Chatterbox Cosplay. Uh, her name's Megan. Okay. She's an amazing cosplayer out in Texas. You know, and she's always willing to help everybody with their cosplays and everything. But with, you know, the whole cosplay, and yeah, and, and of course, no slut shaming, you know, intended because, you know, if you've got it, flaunt it. You know, hey, you know, I'm jealous. I don't have a six pack, but, you know, I really like food. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to uh, torture myself to exercise on a daily basis just to maintain a rock solid body. That's just not me. But my friends, yeah. they like to do that. You know, it's whatever. It's good for them. And uh, sure. But yeah, you're going to get more attention if you're showing off skin. You're going to get more attention if you're um, going to push yourself out there making only fans. Um, and everything like that. So what about a funny uh, cosplay story? Have you ever had a funny experience while in cosplay? I I've been doing this so short. I think the funniest one is that, that one at the library is just walking in and realizing that everybody else that was cosplaying. And you know, the, the other, you were talking about anime stuff, man. So I'm old enough, like when I was 18 or 19, I I watched anime, but it was all the stuff Mm -hmm. that was available in the early East and early nineties. Sailor Moon. (laughs) <laughs> you know, Sailor Moon, um, Ninja Scroll, like, you know, yeah. real uh, Ghost in the Cell, real obvious stuff. Yeah. And so now I'm walking around and I'm seeing these kids in, in costumes and I'm like, I don't even know what character you are or what you're playing. Yeah. I know it's anime. I definitely know it is, but I do not know. Yeah. You know, and, no, and yeah. you're like, and 
in that library, it was super cool because there were whole groups of them. So you knew it was part of the same anime that they were all different characters yeah. and doing a group cosplay. But I, I couldn't tell you what it was from. And it was like, man, that is, yeah. it, it's evolved so much that there's whole genres of things that I don't even know of. Yeah, that happens all the time with, uh, you know, with anime is the kids are way into anime and, and uh, they're like, oh, yeah, My Hero Academia, Sword Art Online, One Punch Man, you know, I'm like, oh what <laughs> yeah it's, there's an anime con called Taiyukon over here in arizona and uh i entered a, a cosplay contest as link and there were nothing but kids basically 16 year olds 17 year olds there were a couple of adults in, the, in there i'm like i'm this is i'm way too old for this apparently but then you know you meet those guys who are in their 40s 50s and they're still cosplaying and you know, or they just got into it and I'm like, Oh, Hey, cool. Because the older we get, the more money we have, you know? <laughs> right. So, and time and time right? and like, time. Yeah. I, I think, you know, for guys our age, I also think there's a, there's a dude in Austin who's uh handle. I don't know what his real name. He goes by Captain America dad. Yeah. And, nice. um, he posts a lot about, uh, and talks a lot about cosplay as therapy. And um, I, I think for guys our age, there is it's tied so much to like how you grew up and where you grew up and um, nostalgia about your childhood, certain elements of your childhood. Like there's definitely an element for me of reclaiming things that I never got to experience or lost yeah. as a kid. Yeah, exactly. Uh, collecting, I, I collect action figures. And I collect a lot of stuff like I wasn't allowed to play with He-Man. So collecting He-Man figures for me wow. is kind of like having something in my childhood that I was I was really strictly denied. Yeah. And um, so I think that also ties into what – so I wouldn't be attracted to um, anime unless it was something like Link, which kind of counts as, as anime because yeah. that's tied to something I remember from my childhood. It's to be interested in. But the yeah. new stuff is just a thing to watch but not necessarily try to be – yeah well you know and also with anime it's it's weird because you're starting to watch it and you're like dude this is very pervy <laughs> like this is like really pervertic you know um perverted but you know it's it is what it is i guess changing of the times so what's the biggest con yeah. that you've been to uh, probably Austin Comic Con, which um, didn't start out very big, but it has gotten bigger every year. Probably would have been substantial this year that they uh, take over the co the convention center here in town, and um, it uh, it takes over the whole convention center, which is pretty sizable. So nice. I you know I don't know enough to give you a comparison, but I would say it's definitely probably up there with Dallas and uh, some of the other regional ones that I've photos and stuff. so it's it's definitely growing and like i said austin is a big geek city so yeah. there's the the need and the want for that convention to get bigger and have more guests and nice. more vip stuff on and you know events around it and all of that yeah so have you ever been mistaken as a different character before while in cosplay I did have that happen once. So uh, a few years ago, uh, there's a big film um, community here in Austin as well. And there was a uh, documentary that came out about uh, convention, mm -hmm. about Comic-Con. And when the um, documentary premiered, they had an after party and they were like, come in costume. So my again, my wife and I talking and then I was, I was a lot heavier and it was like, what can I do? So uh, as a guy who grew up in, as a teenager in the 90s i really liked um you know the the x books especially i was big into rob liefeld and cable and x force mm -hmm. and all that yep. so i did a cable costume so i had um a sleeve over my arm that was all covered in actual metal nice articulated metal. and then i made an eyepiece that had a really bright led in it and i i did makeup over one eye with scarring and uh we did my hair temporary white so that i would have white hair and yeah. All these people saw me coming in with a metal arm and a glowing eye and just kept saying, oh, you're the Terminator. Uh, uh, no, bro, thinking. no. <laughs> people yeah. Thinking, oh, God, you know, and I was like, oh, God, no, please. So that was, yeah. you know, but that's one of those things where unless you know the character and at that point he hadn't been in a movie, so very few people knew who he was. Uh, see why they were. And you just smile and nod. 
that's all you can do. So you're not going to correct a stranger. No, yeah, you're so. just like, all right, man, see ya. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know exactly. So, uh, do you? So you've cosplayed with your wife then? Mm, we've tried. So, like I said, um, uh, Galaxy's Edge was going to be the big one. They at Galaxy's Edge they call it bounding, not cosplaying. So you can't yeah. you can't fully go all the way, right? You can carry prop weapons. You can't carry armor. Um, nothing metal that's questionable because you're walking into a park where there's other people and they don't want a, an incident. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it would be, it would be a, a little bit simplified, um, costuming. So we were definitely going to do that there. We, that year that we went to that, um, Comic-Con after party, we went as Cable and Domino. Nice. Um, so, you know, we, we've tried a couple times, but it's, oh, and one year for Halloween, um, I have a friend, uh, his name is Chris Payne. He's a makeup artist who works on Chicago Fire. He does like burn victim makeup, really grody makeup for people who are burned to death or have bones poking out through their skin and all that stuff. He was he was local, and uh, we had worked on a, a fan film, a Masters of the Universe fan film that was done here in Austin. And so I I asked him to do makeup for me. So we went as Michonne from Walking Dead before she was on the show, mm -hmm. uh, the comic version. Michonne, my wife went as her and i was one of the the zombies that michonne has on the chain she brings behind her so i had a chain around my neck and he did obviously we couldn't remove my jaw but he did makeup where it looked like my face was cut in half and my eyes were um cut out oh wow and, that's um, really cool that was a lot yeah my wife got to walk around with a sword the whole night she loved that um nice so yeah we've we've done a couple times but that's you know cool. again it's one of those things where the excuse usually is halloween so that's yeah. your best excuse really to go out and go to that level of effort without making people feel very uncomfortable. And of course, now they're saying that ca uh, Halloween is canceled, you know, and yeah. I think we're all going to do virtual Halloween. I think people are going to have Halloween parties where they dress up at home and may or may not be wearing pants. You'll never know. Yeah, exactly. You never know during a zoom call, you know? Yeah. That's the, that's the, the, the benefit of, doing virtual and you know, right. you don't have to wear pants or you can wear pajama bottoms, <laughs> have a fancy right. top and then pajama bottoms, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, uh, I definitely for my, for my costume for this, I definitely did the, the pants that go with this, but I didn't do the boots. I was like, he'll never know if I don't, Yeah, wear he'll boots. never know if the boots, unless you got up and said, Oh, Hey, let me see that poster behind you. Then we would see. The boots. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And leather boots, man, uh, you know, just like the armor, those things get hot as hell. Yeah, hot like, as hell. Some of those, uh, some of those cosplayers, like even the pinup cosplayers that are wearing like thigh high boots and stuff, I'm like, man, you are. It looks nice, but you are sweating like crazy under that. <laughs> like, well, yeah, you know, no way. It's it's like the Deadpool cosplayers. It's like, dude, you're. It's a pool of water. You're definitely a pool, yeah. but you're not dead. You're gonna be dead if you don't get water. <laughs> That's a that's a reason I have yet to go to a obviously I've only been to a couple of conventions but I have yet to go to a convention where there isn't a smell and I think a big part of that smell is is the uh, the, dead the really complicated cosplays and the people who are just melting, melting under their, their yeah no it's uh, there was a meme of uh, you know cosplayers you know cosplaying at a convention their cosplay is like a hundred percent like awesome and then Halloween they're in a onesie. <laughs> yeah yeah i can see that too you know the folks who go pro or or do this as a profession i can imagine that you either have to do it all or none if you're yeah. gonna be in costume people expect it to be on point you know and, and amazing and then otherwise you're just like, i don't care and that's the, yeah. only, the only thing you can get away with. I, I think going halfway or to the level that i'm at you know just starting out I, would be a liability if you have a reputation yeah exactly well you know and you've seen it before at conventions where the guest cosplayer is in like some chintzy uh cosplay and they're selling their prints of them in like amazing cosplay i was like dude why aren't you selling your brand you know yeah. and it's all touched and um you know photoshop which again i you know i, I work in marketing i know how that works but it's like I don't know if I'm going to look at this image of you later and be reminded of the real you or just the same thing I see on Instagram. Yeah, exactly. It's like meeting the, the actual cosplayer versus, you know, 
uh, a print and it's just like, wait, that's two different people, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes it's you get that. Thing. It's the same thing when you meet famous people. So again, because Actors, Austin yeah. is a yeah. is a film uh, town, we've had a chance to meet some people. Like my wife met Jason Momoa, and mm -hmm. um, that after party we were at, Elijah Wood was there. And you know, you, when you see people in person, you start to realize how different they are than either your perception of them. Yeah. Or um, you know the the IMDb headshots you see all the time or file photos yeah. from them on the red carpet. Yeah, they, exactly. they look you know, quite a bit different, and they act different than you expect. They're, yeah, they're different people. Yeah, than different what their people. persona. Yeah, it's just like I I got to meet Ron White one time uh, when I was working Country Thunder out in uh, here in Arizona, and uh, Ron White was there, and he came up, and he was a total asshole. And I was like, total asshole. I'm like, whoa. And then yeah. all of a sudden he got a drink in his hand and he was the target of his son of a gun around. And I'm like, wow, dude, what the heck? You did a 180 right there. <laughs> he was like, totally switched. You were like, I want this done. Get this done. I want this done. Don't talk to me. I don't care about you. Boom. And walked out. I'm like, wow, what a jerk. And then all of a sudden yeah. he comes back with a scotch in his hand. He's like, hey, buddy, you can be doing my lights and sound. All right, let's get it done. Woo -woo. And I'm like, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah, totally you know different. The, one, uh, the, the two, my two favorite uh, stories along those lines from um, Austin. So in 2010, they were filming the first Machete film. Here. Okay. And almost everybody who lived in town was in that movie or another i'm i'm in the film as an actor. oh they there you cast go. me yeah they they cast me because i had tattoos yeah. as one of the redneck militia at the end of the, the movie so there's that big battle scene yep. at the end mm -hmm. so if you look really closely in the background you can see me get hit in the face with a shotgun nice um they they pit us against all of these people who are very visibly latino so they cast people who you know in, in a visual stereotype you could tell they had uh latin ancestry yeah, And when we were sitting in extras holding, it was literally all of the guys who were playing the rednecks were sitting on one side of the tent. And all of the people who were playing the Latino, you know, laborers who we were supposed to fight were on the other side of the tent. And no one would talk to each other from those two sides. Yeah. Like, because we looked different, we were all in costume. And because we were cast different, even though if you were walking down the street and you, you met one of those people, you would probably have a conversation with them. Yeah just the idea that we were juxtaposed made us not talk to each other, which is super bizarre. Yeah. But then when we got to the set, uh, Danny Trejo was running around on the set and he is literally the nicest person I have ever met. Yeah. His family. He absolutely is just what you would think from, if you've ever seen an interview with him and he was like, you know, really funny and nice. That is the dude. Like he ran around, it was 108 degrees. Uh, the heels on my boots melted off while we were filming. We were filming on a wow. piece of asphalt. It used to be a, a runway for an airport. And uh, 108 degrees, we were, they had us running passes back and forth behind the camera, so it looked like there were a lot of people in the battle mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. I slipped well, and I looked down, and the heels had melted right off my army boots. And I was just like, what the hell? Like, you know, this is insane. And he was walking around on set handing everybody ice water like, you know, yeah. bottles of water and um, taking selfies with people and talking to him, thanking us. Yeah. Uh, he he remembered my name somehow. He, like, knew who I was. And I was just like, this dude is going well above and beyond. Well, of course, you're the guy him. that fell. He had to get to know your name. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, all of us did, though. We were all rolling around in the dirt and getting beat up and stuff. And yeah. um, he was just walking around thanking people and, you know, thank you for showing up today and all that stuff. And I'm like, man, this dude is, like, way nicer than he has to be considering he's the reason this movie is being made yeah yeah he's he's the main character so is there an ultimate dream cosplay that you have in mind i would so it, it's not a specific thing since i do ocs i wouldn't say i've i've thought of it yet but i really do at some point or another i do want to do something even though we we spent so much time talking about what a nightmare it is I want to do something that is articulated, like um, armor with sound and lights and, and parts that move yeah. and that stuff. The direction I have to go there, and I'm, I'm just starting to learn, is, is some of that Arduino stuff and um, learning how to program your own and, and make your own boards and yeah, all that stuff. But 
it seems super cool to me. If you can do it with sound effects and lights, just like you talk about some of those armor, uh, Iron Man armor guys, right. or uh, I've seen a machine one where he's got the um, the Vulcan cannon on his shoulder that spins and lights yep. up and all that stuff. And it's like, nice. I, I would love to be that good at it and, and really know how to make that kind of stuff. I probably yeah. wouldn't wear it for very often or very yeah, long. Yeah, you'd just be like, <laughs> and then like, take the picture, take the picture. Okay, take it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I've got it. I've got it standing somewhere in my house. Yeah, yeah. That, that's probably my dream is to be able to do something like that because there's so many things you have to know how to do to, to be able to do that. Yeah, exactly. There's a there's a site called uh, Armor Bot, like Full Armor Body Cosplay or something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, Full Body Armor Cosplay or something like that. Oh, by FullBodyArmors dot com. And they have wow. this uh, Iron Man cosplay or, or, you know, costume that is full metal, full lights up, sounds, everything. It opens up so you could step out of it. You know, voice wow. changer, $10,000. I'm like, jeez. Yeah. I see a lot of people producing, especially because of the, the Mandalorian show. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys that are forging metal Mandalorian armor. And again... It looks beautiful, but to wear it, you're talking about an additional five or ten pounds of metal on your body and very, you know, parts of your body that will feel it. You know, yeah. if it's on your legs, that's one thing. But if you're wearing it on your torso and every time you move or breathe, you're, yeah. you're against that resistance, you really notice it. Yeah, exactly. And you're, you're going to you feel that on, difference. <laughs> yeah. If you throw onto it the jet pack and the weapons and all that other stuff and a helmet, like man, that's a that's a big investment and a lot of a lot of work just to walk around. Yeah, just to walk on. So, uh, when you're making your cosplays, do you go to thrift shops or, or uh, to buy the material, or do you go to like stores and buy a vest and then you you makeshift it? So that's a, a good question. So as I said, part of my uh, my thing, and I'm, I'll, I'll show you my DL44 as an example. Part of my thing is to kind of recreate the props in the way that they were created, so not identical. Yeah. So DL44 is the blaster that Han Solo carries, um, and the base for the blaster is, is a mouser. That's a World War II mouser. Okay. And then um, there's stuff bolted on here. So for instance, this is a, an airsoft scope. Um, there's some 3D printed greeblies on here, little pieces of things. Mm -hmm. uh, this grill on the front's 3D printed. Um, this is an LED from a, an abandoned lightsaber project I have on here. Nice. So some of this stuff is random. There's some pieces of model kits um, glued on, sprayed and glued on. So you you know what you're looking for, and then you really want to get fun in the the pack and the uh, power oh, pack wow. is actually a crew. You know, so um, it's that detail it's that's amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of things where you're like, you know, some of it is stuff you can thrift and and repurpose junk, literal yeah. junk to do. Some of it you have to very, you know, the the airsoft mouser I had to specifically look for and find one that was the right scale and and all of that. Yeah, so exactly. So some things you have to look for, and that's where it gets expensive is when you have to look for something specific. Like I need, yeah, very specific. Yeah, it's um, it's, it's then, crazy sometimes. You you have to go through great lengths sometimes to find what you want. Some of the stuff like the code cylinders on my, my vest here are just uh, tactical uh, flashlights that I cut up and, and repurpose. So some stuff is real easy, like two bucks for some nice. of this stuff. And then other things are, um, are super expensive. You sit there and you have to ask yourself, is this worth it? Will it look as cool as I hope it will? Yeah. Uh, will it be durable and hold up? Am I going to wear it once and have it fall apart mm -hmm. uh, is always a good question. So that's that's where the thing comes in. And sometimes you don't know until you make it. You can get, like, lightsabers are notorious for that. Some of these props are notorious for it. You could put a lot of money and time into it and then realize it doesn't work the way you thought it would or doesn't look the way you thought. That could be super. Yeah, exactly. So have you ever done a cosplay panel yet? No, I haven't. Um, this is as close as I've gotten. Like I said, I'm I'm such a baby to the art. I can't imagine that anybody would want to talk to me in, in any authority i think the only thing i think your I'm, your I'm magic really, honestly is like the prop building that those are amazing yeah. props you have a talent that is like anybody would envy <laughs> yeah 
It's it's crazy. I don't see it that way because I see guys who build stuff. Now, obviously, most of them are selling it. So most of the best stuff I see is people trying to sell things. I'm not trying yeah. to sell anything. Yeah. I make things I can care for. Yeah, you want to be able to cosplay them and you know show them off. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I, I see people uh, make just amazing, amazing stuff. Like, you know, uh, I was talking about the Vulcan. So there's a, a, a sort of a Gatling gun, a laser Gatling gun that some mm-hmm. of the clone troopers carry. And I've seen a lot of guys make those. And it's got like a digital counter on the side to show you how many shots it has left. Wow. And, uh, and idle ways. You can change the lights so it looks like it's firing, you know, stun rounds, blue rounds, and it has a different sound versus red, which is like, you know, the deadly lasers. and That's a different sound. So I see some of that stuff, and I'm like, man, that's a whole other, you know, level that I'm obviously not at yet. But my stuff, my my wife says the same thing. My stuff is just about little details, like little things that uh, that I I think are cool and I think look lived in and part of the the world. You know, yeah, like the crystal, for instance, as the power pack. Yeah. You know, that's really yeah. creative. So yeah, yeah, know, exactly. maybe you maybe you can run a cosplay panel on prop building. You know, I I would love to do something about people just getting started. I think the two things that I I would be qualified to talk about is like where do you start? Because I yeah. had no idea. Yeah, exactly. like eight months ago, um, when I when I first started losing significant amounts of weight, I was like, okay, now what? Mm-hmm. You know, I said I was going to do this thing. Uh, what do I have to do? And I think the other thing that I'm qualified to talk about is what, you know, what is cosplay play besides a hobby? What is, yeah. it, you know, and that's why I mentioned the Captain Ameridad guy is talking about this. This obviously means more. There's, there's a community, there's a sense of community to it, but it obviously means more to people for different reasons. For me, yeah. this is being able to wear some of this stuff as a symbol of, you know, I literally crawled out of my version of hell. Yeah. I could not breathe, and I thought I was going to have a heart attack. And here I am, able to do this. Nice. So it has a meaning beyond like dressing up and looking, you know, like you're cool, yeah, uh, or not cool, depending on what you're yeah. shooting for. Exactly. Um, to to where it represents something that um, is is a, a part, a bigger part of something else. Yeah. No, it's, it's awesome. the same thing with toys. You know, I, I collect those toys not just because I like them, but they they symbolize something. Everything yeah. is a symbol. Exactly. Um, and it's the same way with cosplay. When you look at people who are wearing different costumes and you have a conversation with them and you're like, you know, why? what drew you to this character? You do this all the mm-hmm. time. Yep. What drew you to this character or to this uh, particular piece of fiction or to this genre? What, what was it that was attractive about that? And that's what's fascinating. And yeah. I think that's the part people don't understand about cosplay. They think it's just people who have a lot of free time and nothing else going on in their life. It's like, no, right. to go to this level and spend this amount of time, it has to have some other. Mm-hmm. So like everything, there's an evil side of everything. So what are some bad things about cosplay? Um, so in my experience and my limited experience so far, I will say it has swung the other way. So we talked about when we were kids and we were young being nerd, like you were, you're mm-hmm. a, a performing arts nerd. Like I went yeah. to art school. I went to Savannah College of Art and Design. Yeah. So we we had a sort of a running joke about the performing arts kids. Mm-hmm. You know, they all had their kind of own language. They'd be quoting uh, yep. uh, Shakespeare Rosen- all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and you know, um, just just in their own language, in their own world together all the time. So that's that's one thing um, to have that community. But I've seen it swing the other way, and especially the response towards people who are new mm-hmm. and um, a lot of times people who are female mm-hmm. and people who are new and female um, where guys our age or people who have been into geek culture for a while become the gatekeepers and become very, very difficult to approach and not welcoming. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of, I have seen a lot, a lot of that. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense to me because all we wanted when I was young, before I met my wife and got married, all I wanted was to find uh, a girl who understood this stuff and was cool with it. Yeah. And so if you're going to try to keep women out of geek culture and cosplay, all you're doing is preventing that opportunity for people to meet who have similar loves and interests and, and are, are expressing those, you know, keeping that closed. And I think that's the worst thing for me. And it's, it, it works its way out in Twitter a lot. 
social media. Yeah, of it's course. just that intense gatekeeping. I think part of it is people who are, are again our age who are like, I bled for this, I yeah. fought for this, you know. And you'll never know how hard it was in, in the 1980s and 90s when people thought you were stupid for being into these things. But yeah. I, I think the other part is also like, what happens if cosplay doesn't look like it? What happens if I'm a minority in cosplay and everyone yeah. else is young and, and you know just knows this as being cool and, and all that stuff? What happens when I'm not the authority? Yeah. And um, I'm not I'm not scared of that personally. I think that's super cool. Um, I have a, a nephew who's 18 and he's big into anime, and I want nothing more than that kid to to go read and experience and course, cosplay yeah. and do all that. Yeah, yeah, he should have that without yeah. having to feel weird about it. You exactly. Know? Um, so I, I I don't I don't get it necessarily. I understand why, but I think it's self ultimately. You'll yeah. either give people negative experiences or you make them have to prove you wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. which is good for them, but bad for you, you know, eventually. So, yeah, exactly. And you, you never know if, if you're going to branch out and, and go into this world that is so unknown to us now because people are making, Oh, their own renditions of a character. They're making like, okay. So instead of a, a f male link that is known as game culture as link is a male, now he's, he's female, and so a lot of females are gender bending to male characters, and and it's it's interesting. It's like okay, this is going to be interesting, you know. It's, it's or a mascot where you're combining different things, you yeah. know, like uh, Disney princess uh, Mandalorians and and things like that. I see. Yeah, I, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's super cool. There's a creativity to that because you have nothing like. I have things I can refer to for props and stuff like yeah. that, but they have nothing. They're making it up as they go along. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and it might be unrecognizable to you, but you got to respect that level of effort and creativity. You have to have some sort of respect for that. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, the more cosplaying gets popular, the more we're going to have a lot of renditions of cosplays and, you know, it's it's kind of weird. The older you get, the the younger the the cosplayers look, and you're like, okay, am am I the pervert? <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. you know, like uh, what's going on here? But like then, like like I said, you know, you, you know, older you get, the more you're able to cosplay. You know, I can't wait until I get old enough to be able to cosplay Archibald from Umbrella Academy. <laughs> That'd be cool. I'll be like, I'm yeah. actually his age. <laughs> you know, that would be cool. Yeah, my wife always jokes about me getting old enough to do the uh the old guy from up, you know. Yep, just there you go. To the water with the balls and... <laughs> but you know, it it's the other thing I think is that you know when you think about cosplay and geek culture, th there's there are properties we all know. Like we all know Star Wars and and we know Star Trek and we know this other stuff, but unless creative people die new stuff is going to come out umbrella academy is a good example that yep. came out of nowhere for me yeah it just came out of left field it's just like what is this this is a thing um and so you want that you want uh new things being made and yeah, created exactly and you want people to be interested in those otherwise it's just only ever going to be star wars and that will get super super boring super fast it'll be you know 100 there's already like 100 people dressing up as variation of deadpool yeah um so many so variations you, you want, yeah you you want people to uh speaking of which at the austin comic-con there was somebody who did the bob ross deadpool with the, nice the, the paint brushes and i was like okay so if you're gonna be deadpool that's super creative like that's i dig that you know yeah um but yeah, you, you want new stuff out there you want to see things that you haven't seen before i i kind of feel the same way when you talk about the the pinup thing like you know yeah. we're talking about old leaf and all that yeah is is cringe inducing as it can be sometimes because it's a it's very much a commercial part of the culture somebody yeah. trying to sell their phone and they're only it's also like that is a gateway for some people who didn't even think of cosplay as okay but then if you see someone you find is incredibly attractive confident enough to get geek tattoos yeah and wear geek costumes in various stages of undress or whatever um, it, it can normalize it in a way that very few things, uh, you know, can in culture. So in, in a sense, it, yeah. it is necessary, even if you don't agree with it or you don't feel comfortable with it. It's like a, 
an interesting gateway for some yeah. people to to see it as okay. Yeah, if a hot girl does it. Why can't I? You know. Yeah, speaking of geek tattoos, I got a geek tattoo, the dark mark from Harry Potter. Oh yeah, right on. Yeah. I uh I just if you can see the mud one from uh, Mandalorian. Oh, there you got go. This one. This is my second week of healing on it. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. They're expensive though, man. This one cost me one hundred and forty dollars. I'm like, Yeesh. okay, man. Yeah. Gotta lower the prices, <laughs> you know, friends and yeah. family. <laughs> but uh, I, I feel yeah, like it's you know, speaking of the the pandemic and all that stuff, like I, there's there's a local artist who's done a lot of work on my wife, and um, we talked to her, and she had a very strict um, protocol for how she was going to do the tattoo and and all that stuff. Everybody was masked. There was only two people allowed Good. in the shop. And I feel like right now you're trying to keep an artist alive, right? Yeah. She's got no other real income. So I'm like, let, let me come in and get a couple tattoos from you so that, you know, at least you got some income because yeah. I don't know how they're paying rent. Yeah. You know? It's, it's hard. It's with this whole pandemic, a lot of people are losing their jobs. A lot of people are like, you know, going crazy at home and everything. And hopefully next year we're going to have like a little ease on that. And hopefully we're, not going to get sick every time we walk out and do something like, you know, we're seeing it in the schools, you know, my daughter's school wants to go hybrid learning in October. And I'm like, no, no, we're, she stays home. We're good. <laughs> we're not going to deal with that. I keep hearing parents say this stuff about, oh, but my kid won't socialize. And I'm like, I didn't really socialize as a kid. Did I turn out all that bad? Yeah. That much you, of a yeah. You got married. Yeah. We got married. Yeah. You had, you know, works works it worked you know so. no yeah it's, it's it's always the thing is this um because people think schools and you know parents and they're like oh they gotta socialize at school and it's like dude they could socialize on freaking wechat and, and tiktok and all that stuff come on it's, i mean how well know. socialized are they gonna be and this is this is a grim way to say it but how socialized are they gonna be if their friends start dropping like that's you have to yeah like, yeah, and like, real. how's that going to fuck them up in the head? You know, like, oh, my best friend died of COVID because I wasn't wearing my mask and I gave him COVID or something, you know, and, and it's there's so many things that we can go on and on about. But, um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for coming on to the show and uh, giving a little bit more insight of like where you started. And, you know, but the question I have for you is what's the future of you know, Torque Jorah. Jora. What's the future um, I, of I you? Think that I, I think it's just going to be uh, learning how to do new things, learning how to, to make different types of props, uh, you know, learning new skills. At some point, it's going to involve welding, and it's going to involve more, you know, creating my own electronics. and nice. All those things. Uh, as you go, you, you just kind of have to learn, right? If you want to make mm -hmm. better and better props and, and cooler looking things and... Uh, I, I think that's really the future for a lot of us is learning new skills. We're going to end up like uh, old timey, uh, multidisciplinary people who apprenticed, you know, yeah. back in the day when you used to apprentice as a blacksmith. Now yeah. you're, everybody's doing it virtually and learning all these, um, these different skills. And, and at some point or another, yeah, yeah exactly. it might be me doing stuff and, um, you know, making nice. my own leather, leather wear boots and things. I think that's the, the direction that things are going for me and for a lot of people. Cool. Well, once again, thank you so much for your time, and I wish you all the luck in your future cosplays. Right on. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Yep. Bye.